Uh, yeah, they were going to try to come. Yeah, but I don't think they're going to, they're going to be able to make it. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you are just uh, going to get tuned in tonight, hey, go ahead and uh, let us know. Say hello and uh, let us know who all is out there hanging out with us. Uh, no, I, I visited with uh, Larry and Pam today, and they said they were going to try to come, but they just were not for sure. When did they have it? hundred percent. It is tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Yeah. Where is it? It is going to be here at the, the cemetery out on 1B. I don't know the name. Force. Force Park. Force Park. Yes, thank you, Dan. Uh, it is at Force Park. Mm -hmm. um, no, a he worked for a funeral home in Camden, oh, okay. and so they have taken care of everything. And so he'll be bringing, uh, they will be bringing uh, the body. There's Jack and Sandy. Glad you guys are here. Glad you guys are hanging out with us. I know uh, Miss Sandy. And speaking of Miss Sandy, we're going to go ahead and talk about her. Uh, uh, she said today that her hip is doing great, that she's doing her best to try to go dancing, but she just can't just yet. But the medicine that she's on is, is kind of working against her stomach. So we want to uh, remember her. And uh, she's thinking that when she gets off the meds, uh, you know, she's only on for a short period of time, then she'll be, she will be fine. There's Miss Jessie, and there is Brian Ponder. Good afternoon, guys. Glad all y'all are here. Again, go ahead and let me know. There's Judy Davis. Glad all you guys are, are uh, tuning in and uh, hanging out with us and all that good stuff. Uh, I talked to Chester Crossing today, and they had, boy, I talked to him early, and they had just got back from Little Rock from doctor's appointments, but they're doing fine. Uh, and speaking of Miss Judy, Miss Judy, glad that you were on here. Uh, Miss Judy said that she is doing better with her arm. She goes back to the orthopedic doctor in three weeks for more x-rays. Uh, still sore, you know, has, has those good days. I did speak to Linda DeVazier today. She said that she's doing better, and they as a family are just trying to move forward uh, with, the, with the loss. Uh, Miss Pat had been a little sick over the weekend, had a cough. And so she is doing okay. And, and on Johnny, like I was telling you, uh, try to get a hold of JD and, and uh, uh, Miss Bobby. And all I got was an answering server. So how, how are they doing, Dan? How are they doing? Kind of just, just, hanging just, just hanging in. Okay. Uh, I also have a <laughs> Pretty much assure you that those people want to sell me an extended warranty on my vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is a, a gentleman whose wife's father passed away, uh, and I want to say that he was the neighbor of Jack and Sandy. Jack, uh, Miss Sandy, who was the name? Leroy somebody. Ward. Leroy Ward. Ward. Leroy Ward. Thank you. And then it was. Yes. Yes, he sure did. And his daughter is married to this gentleman I'm actually friends with. I can't remember his name to save my life. He goes to First Baptist. I know. Uh, Freddie Houston. Yes, yes, Freddie Houston. Freddie. Freddie's wife fell last night mm -hmm. and had to be taken to the hospital. And I don't know any results. I've not seen anything. So do you, either one of y'all know? Okay, I don't know. So if anybody knows any updates on, on Freddie's wife, so let us know. So we do want to want to do that, and that is all the news I've got. Uh, we want to remember Pam and her family, as uh, they are going to have a graveside service tomorrow afternoon at Forest Park. Is that right? Forest Park. At, yeah. the, at Park. Jeff and Henry both have the nerve. Oh no. He, he has to do all of the funerals at Central, and you know I think that churches. Yeah. And that's one of his jobs. So he's going to be, um, you know, out there. They've been going now for a week, and they called him yesterday. That was the part of the and said, You know, they call and ask you if you have any, had any symptoms before they release you. So right. And out, and they said that uh, he couldn't go to it. And he was in Libby's uh, uh, heart rate went way up oh. uh, yesterday. Oh. And they got it back down. But uh, Jeff. Oh, no. Headaches and diarrhea and all that stuff. Sure. But he says they're doing a lot better a lot of them. Right. Wow, wow, wow. Bless them. Bless them. 
uh, lots of lots of folks locally are beginning to get that. Uh, hello to Miss Danny. Miss Danny, you texted me just a little bit ago. You've had a long day, so she's going to be hanging out with us online. Uh, a lot of folks are getting this virus, okay? Uh, so we, we want to be, be very very careful, very cautious uh, in what you do, where you go, uh, all of that good stuff. Uh, uh, any other prayer requests that I'm missing? Folks, if you're online, let us know if you have additional prayer requests as well. Uh, I know the uh, the group from Colt met today at Fitzgerald Crossing. Today was their day to have drive through prayer, so they always have a lot of folks who come through there. So I'm so thankful for that. Big, big ministry. Uh, any uh, other prayer requests? Adjust that. This makes me look like I have a flat top, so I'm going to adjust that. That's kind of funny. There we go. All right. No other prayer requests. All right, guys. Thank you for all tuning in. If you, again, if you have prayer requests, make sure that you send it to us, and we will get those. Uh, let's open up prayer. Father, golly, we love you so much. We thank you, Father, for the day you blessed us with. We thank you, Father, for the changing of the seasons. It's here, it's coming, and we know it. And, Father, we just give you all the glory and honor as we just enjoy the, the, the harvest season. We're able to see the harvest. We're able to, to just enjoy what all is going on on your beautiful earth. Father, we have so many that we want to lift up to you tonight. God, for, for Pam and her family and as, they, as they say goodbye to, to Pam's brother Rush tomorrow afternoon. Father, we pray that you'll just wrap your arms continually around, around her and around that entire family. Father, for uh, Mr. Leroy Ward's family, God, we pray the same thing. And God, for Freddie's wife, we don't know the severe of that. We just ask you to, uh, to be with her, to take care of her. Uh, Father, we, we pray for, for Jeff and Wendy Stotts as they are just trying to, uh, to get over this virus. Father, we pray you'll just deliver them from that. For Miss Judy, Lord, to continue to heal uh, her arm and uh, God for Miss Sandy to continue to heal that hill as she just just moves forward and Father for all of our folks that uh, have been sick and, and those that have been struggling God we just pray for your divine healing in ways that only you can Father we pray for our church family we ask you Lord that you will just draw us closer together Lord as we look this day as as uh, as we, we dove into 1 Corinthians this morning Father just a, a complete spirit of oneness just complete unity. Father, that's what we're praying for in your body. God, tonight as we dive into your word, will you just speak to us in a very clear and a very powerful way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are going to go into the very last part of the book of Ephesians. So go ahead and get your Bibles out. Dan and Bev are hanging out. So I'll say, Dan and Bev, glad you guys are here. Dan, how you feeling? Uh, go ahead and fill us in on what's going to go on with you. Who else is on this morning? Let's we'll see here. There's Wanda Arnold. Say hello to Wanda. Let's her and Ken are, uh, Ken may be in by now. Ken drives a uh, school bus for when? Y'all, it was good to see Carrie and Lisa Sunday. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought we had uh, we had 44. We had 44. Uh, that was our uh, our morning attendance. We had 22 in Sunday school, 44 for, uh, for preaching. Okay, Ephesians chapter six. Now, if you did you notice, I don't have my whiteboard. I don't have my whiteboard. I put Naomi Williams on the prayer list, so I'm not sure who Naomi Williams is. Miss Judy, if you'll tell us. Uh, a little bit more detail, that would be great. Uh, and let us know what's going to go on. Uh, what, what one thing, if you, could, if, if you could put your finger on just one thing, what has stood out to you as we have pieced together this whole armor of God and this, this thought of spiritual warfare? What has what really stood out to you? And if you're watching, go ahead and, and share. I know you're delayed, but that's okay. What one thing maybe has stood out to you that it, it, maybe it's like a, oh, I forgot about that, or wow, I didn't realize that. So what one thing? Anybody? Warning us to stay in defensive mode continually. That's right. Got to stay in a defensive mode continually. Why is that? Because somebody else is on the offense continually. Continually. 
Yeah. Have, have you all realized that? We're always being attacked. We're always being attacked. Okay. Good, good, good. Miss Danny says you've got to put it on. And that's right. You do have to have to knowingly you've got to put it on. Danny's doing very good. Okay. That's an excellent phrase. Uh, for Naomi Williams, our prayer list, for those of you who are writing this down, uh, she had a stroke. So that's who we want to remember. And I do not know this lady, but we do want to remember her. Uh, what else? What has stood out to you about the whole armor of God? They used to be members of our church. Okay. See, we have right across from our business. Okay. What well, one thing? Do you think we overlook it? Do we overlook the whole armor? I think we do. I definitely think we do. Let's go back. Let's pick up at verse 11. At verse 11 here in chapter 6, Paul is beginning to wind it down. And he says this. Put on, you've got to put it on, put on the whole armor that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up, there's that physical part of it, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. All right. This is not optional. Imagine our men and women overseas in battle and the general rolls into the barracks and says, okay, by the way, men, ladies, you need to go out to the front lines, but you don't have to put on your gear today. How would that work? It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Would they be successful? Chances are no. Chances are absolutely not. You cannot leave it in the closet. You cannot pick and choose which ones of those items that you have the choice for, but you have an entire suit of armor to wear on a daily basis because we are in a daily battle against a very real enemy. He is not fictitious. He is very real, and he is against everything that you and I do. He is against everything that you and I stand for. In verse 18 is where we're going to pick up at. We've just put on all the pieces. The last thing we talked about was our weapon. We talked about the only weapon, the makaira, the short 12 to 18-inch double-edged sword. Now, Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Okay, Paul says that after we have carefully made sure that we have suited up with each specific piece of God's armor, that we now, now and hear the words I'm about to say. Now then we arm ourselves with prayer. We arm ourselves. It's part of the armor. You literally arm yourselves with prayer. Do we see prayer as a piece of the armor? And I share with you, I don't think we do. I just don't. What? Do we see prayer as a piece of the armor? Okay, good. Good. I don't think as a whole Christians do. I really don't. Here's the thing. Our enemy does not want us praying. Why? Why? Why does he not want the believers to pray? Because you're not prayed up. I mean, there's no reason to wear anything. Well, prayer adds a, a team member or a soldier to the battle that he can't overcome. That's exactly right. You see. Well, you've got all this armor on you. Right. But your protection really comes from above. And if that arrow is going to get you somewhere. Right. And you've got to be prepared to know, know it's there. Well, I know what that is. That's right. Get rid of it. He does not want us praying because he knows that the power of prayer is greater than anything he has. Prayer defeats Satan instantaneously. And we have to understand that. He is guilty of distracting us from praying simply by giving us 
what I, I just wrote down is seemingly sensible reasons not to pray. How many of you have been distracted about your prayer time today? Okay. Yeah, exactly. And we, we, we can dismiss that as, well, I was just tired. Or I just didn't think about it. Or I got caught up doing laundry. Or I was mowing the yard. Okay? Sensible reasons that I didn't pray. Well, here's the thing. That's strategic on our enemy's part. It's very strategic. Wearing the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and yielding the sword of the word of God is never easy. And here's what I really want us to take home tonight. Wearing the whole armor demands discipline and effort. It demands us to be ever watchful. It demands us to do it on purpose, intentionally. And it's completed with much prayer. Prayer isn't just a piece of the armor. It's a non-negotiable in winning the battles. I, 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 I put it like this. Prayer is the gut and the grit of the battle. It's, it's the all oh, that, that goes forth. It's almost the attitude that if I'm prayed up, I can conquer things. Have you ever entered problems and, and you were prayed up and you thought, okay, this is really not that bad. And then you've entered problems and you are not prayed up and you're like, oh, Lord. It's a mental thing. It's a, it's a, it, it's a challenge. There are several memes that are on, on the social media about prayer that, that look something like this. There's a picture of a group of small kittens going into a room and it says before prayer and then the next picture is the same amount of cats but now then they're lions walking out and they put active prayer and that's really a very good illustration of what you and I are that's what prayer does for us it's completed with prayer prayer isn't a piece of the armor it is a non-negotiable it is the good and the grid it's what taps into the power of god that enables us to wear the armor in the first place now why did paul so strongly call the ephesians to prayer any thoughts why did he really really call this church into prayer? one. He understood that all believers battle against the enemy. He knew that every person in that church, every believer that he had ever come in contact with, every believer that was going to come onto the planet was going to battle against the enemy. No follower of Jesus is immune to Satan's attacks. None. Now let's think about how Satan has attacked people in scripture. He attacked Peter, right? He attacked Paul himself. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. And he even attacked Jesus. And if he will attack the Son of God physically on this earth, then you and I shouldn't expect anything less. He ought to be, well, we ought to be knowing that if he's going to go after Jesus with what we're going to call the, the three greatest weapons, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, then he's going to come at us with everything in the kitchen, but the kitchen sink. So he understood that believers battle. Those who fail to recognize the reality of the battle are the most deceived of all believers. We are in a battle. Paul also knew the intensity of the attack. Turn back over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at Paul's attack. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In this chapter, we're going to start hanging out around verse 7. Paul used the word translated buffeting, buffet, buffeting or tormenting in an attack. Second Corinthians verse seven of chapter 12, Paul writes this, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted Above measure. Buffeting. Translated tormenting to describe this attack. Here's what this means. This is the description. How many of you have seen things like uh, Three Stooges 
or cartoons. Foghorn Leghorn comes to mind when I think about this. And uh, the, the Foghorn Leghorn would run out to the dog, okay? Y'all know these cartoons. And he'd go grab the dog and he'd snatch the dog up and he would and then take off, okay? It's a back and forth, okay? This word, buffet, means that exact same thing. That's what Satan does to us, is he just grabs our life. And that's what Paul is describing. And he also describes him as a thorn, or this problem, as a thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh. Do we know what Paul's problem was? Do we know what that thorn was? What was the thorn? Anybody? If you're watching online, if you've got any thoughts, I'd love to hear you. Exactly, do no, we don't know exactly, but we think we do. Yeah, we, we think we know. There's a lot of theologians lean toward one direction. Yeah. It says probably some kind of weakness or disease. Okay, you're, you're on the right path, but more specifically. And Going blind. blind. Mm -hmm. It's very strongly thought through most theologians that Paul's eyesight was fading rapidly. But Paul didn't care. It was not going to slow him down from doing what Paul did. Now let's continue reading at verse 8. Let's, let's imagine this, that it is his eyesight that's fading. He calls it a thorn in the flesh. He calls it a messenger of Satan. Verse 8. Concerning this thing... I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Have you ever been attacked? Have you ever had something come to you that was aggravating you or tormenting you and you asked God multiple times to get rid of it? Yes. Every time. We sure did. He says, I didn't do it once or twice. I did it three times that it would just leave. And then Paul says this, and he said to me, this is God speaking now to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. In other words, my grace is greater than the problem you're having. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I am stronger because you are weaker. I'm stronger because you're struggling with, in this case, if it was his eyesight. Yes, Miss Penny, you're exactly right. So Paul has acknowledged this. Therefore, Paul says, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do we see our problems that way? Or are we consistently, God, you've got to get rid of this. God, this has got to go. And it doesn't leave, and we come back. God, God, we talked about this. It really needs to go. And a week later, God... Okay, now God, we got to get serious. I'm struggling here. We got to help. Or do we understand that the things that we are having to contend with and to deal with, and, and we're aging, okay? We're all aging. Now, granted, we got this sweet little girl right here, and so I'm going to take her out of the conversation. But the rest of us understand what it is like to age, okay? I don't have near as much energy as I had a couple years ago. Do y'all? I don't. And I used to be as strong as a horse. I mean, I, I could lift up cars. You know, two or three, two, three guys, me and a couple of guys, we could literally physically pick up a car. I do good to pick up a leg right now to take a forward step. Okay? And so my body is aging. There are things about my body that are not working. Very similar to my cause, if it was his eyesight. My eyes are not near what it was. I remember specifically, I was in my 30s. And I had as good as 20, 20 plus of my eyesight. And my doctor, I remember specifically him telling me, he said, I need you to understand something. When you turn 40, your eyesight is going to change. The eyesight of a man changes when he's 40. And you know what old Jim said? I said, you're a lying dog. There is no way that's going to happen. I can't ever foresee that happening because I could see I mean, I could, I could count the hairs on a fly on the other side of the door. I had amazing eyesight. On my 40th birthday, 
October the 1st of the year 2000, it was like a switch was flipped and my eyesight degraded immediately. And that aggravated me. And I still, I, and it has progressively gotten worse. And so do we see something like that as an opportunity to give God glory? Or do we see it as a, God, you really should have done something about that. And now we're, we're talking about what prayer really is. Prayer is about understanding that I am weak, but when I am weak, then he is strong. Because it gives him that opportunity for the strength. Paul knew the intensity of the attack. He also knew the importance of believers praying for others who might face the same kind of assault. Do we pray for others so that they don't go through what we're praying, what we're going through? Whatever you're experiencing right now, uh, whatever you have experienced, are you praying for others that they would not do that? Three, Paul expected believers to rejoice always, even when under attack from the enemy. Uh, let's Let's see, we're in 2 Corinthians. Let's, uh, we've just read verses 8 through 10. So he, and he appreciated and he expressed joy even when under attack. I, I'm going to run back over now to, where am I going? 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. Actually, I'm going to pick up in verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting at verse 12. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Paul expected us as believers to rejoice always. He had learned from his own battles with his own thorn in his flesh how to rejoice despite them. He pleaded with God to remove the thorn. God said, not going to happen. And so in the end, Paul learned that God's grace was sufficient for him and he even rejoiced in the catastrophes, the persecutions, and in the pressures and he did not want any other believer to miss out on that. He wanted them all to rejoice. And last, Paul understood the brevity of life. Where was Paul when he wrote the book of Ephesians? He's in jail cell. That's right. He's in jail cell. He's shackled. He is in a jail cell not knowing if he's going to live or, live or die. Understanding that he has a thorn in the flesh and it's most probably his eyesight. And he never wanted to miss an opportunity to glorify Christ. So he sought the prayers of others. And we see that uh, there in the latter part of Ephesians. We have to always understand that life is uncertain. Do you have the, the guarantee of tomorrow? No. No. And if you do have the guarantee of tomorrow, if you know you're going to wake up and if you are there and you get into tomorrow, do you have the guarantee that it's going to be a good day? No. Do you have the guarantee that Satan's not going to come at you like a, like a freight train? You're going to run smack over you. We don't have that guarantee. So we have got to be prayed up. Paul called for prayer at all times with all perseverance because he knew that the Christian life is always a battle. Honest question. For those of you online, I really want you to hear what I'm about to say. How would you rate your sense of urgency for your typical prayers? On a scale of 1 to 10. You don't have to answer out loud. Where's the sense of urgency for your prayer? Do we go about it nonchalantly? Is it just something you try to do in your daily routine? Or are you, are you really on purpose with your prayers? Are you focused in so that you are, are giving it the proper time, the, the, the proper focus? On a scale of 1 to 10, how urgent are your prayers? In, in, in these verses. We have to understand that Paul meant praying at all times means living in such a way that nothing hinders our prayers. It means my nap is not going to hinder my prayer. It means my lunch is not going to hinder my prayer. 
It means that I'm intentionally going to turn my phone off or I'm not going to answer a phone call while I'm praying. Okay. It means turning my computer off. I'm not going to get online. I'm not going to have my television on because I don't want to be in the middle of, of my prayer time. And then all of a sudden, my favorite TV show comes on and I'm like, excuse me, I got, and I got to be watching I Love Lucy or something. Okay. We have to be intentional in preventing things to hinder us in our prayers. Some other things that could hinder us in prayers. We depend on ourselves to figure things out, not God. Maybe we have unconfessed sin. Maybe we have a lack of faith. Paul knew all of these things, but Paul simply lived for Christ. It was never about him. He didn't care if he was in prison. It never slowed him down. It never kept him from doing what God had called him to do. Paul lived for Christ. And he considered everything, and we, we know this passage of Scripture. It's out of Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Paul considered everything lost if he didn't know Christ by faith. Everything else was worthless if he just didn't pray. It also means praying at all times, being ever aware of the needs of others. Are we aware of the needs of the people around us? The people we work with, the people we see in our stores, the people we see in our neighborhoods, the people we go to church with. I love what Miss Penny says. Time is so short, our world is in crisis. We must be diligent. That's very good, Miss Penny. That's very true. Praying at all times means being ever aware of the needs of others. Remember, we're putting this in context in the whole armor of God, right? So if we're praying and it is a urgency of our prayer, if we're making sure that there is a sense of urgency at all of our prayers, then doesn't it mean that we're going to battle for our fellow man? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes we get so busy just doing good stuff that we miss the hurting people around us. Are we aware of what's going on in the next door neighbor's house? Person that works across the desk from us. Praying at all times also means praying for others before they face trouble. Now, right now, I would dare say that every one of us in the room have got friends or family members that everything is doing just good. Everything's fine. Okay? I mean, they're healthy. They're being able to work. They've got plenty to eat. They're, they, they've got enough money in the bank. Are we still praying for them to God to continue to provide for them and to protect them? Praying in the good times. Or do we wait till something screwy goes on and we pray for them when things have already gone south? We should we always be... For answering that prayer. I'm sorry? Do we thank Him for answering that And do we thank Him for answering the prayer? That's exactly right. Focus on... on and, and, and this is... And this is not about patting me on the back, but my daily part of my prayers is that part of for, for my kids is that God will continue to provide and to protect. And that Colson will grow strong just as he is and he will grow big and that nothing would hinder that. And, and as I look, just like I saw that little sport today, I mean, he is growing, he is strong, and he is being provided for, he is being protected and so I'm seeing God do all this work, and I can't stop. I've got to continue to pray for that, and I want to encourage us all to do that. Uh, I want us to continue to pray and to thank God for what he's doing in the lives of our friends and families. Even though they are in a perfect mode, it doesn't mean that they're not being attacked, or it doesn't mean that they won't be attacked, because we are consistently in a battle. We've got to remember, praying at all times, what did we say earlier? It hinders Satan at work. All it does is it just smacks him backwards. Every time I pray, I, 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 I force him to go backwards. And that's what prayer does. An outwardly focused life that recognizes the needs of others avoids our own self-centeredness that characterizes who Satan is. Praying at all times results in victory for us and for others. And when we really think about it, the righteous living that makes prayer effective is the essence of wearing the breastplate. That's what prayer does. Now, as we begin to wrap up Ephesians, looking specifically at the armor, let me just say this. Prayer is one of the most difficult spiritual disciplines to develop. I mean, you, you just think about that. We can have all the Bible reading plans that we want, right? I mean, you know, places like Uversion or uh, different, different websites gives you checkoff lists 
for Bible reading plans. I can provide you with a dozen of them. And it's real simple. I've got my sheet of paper, and I'm going to read these chapters of this book today, and check mark, it's done. Okay? It's easy. I can set parameters on fasting. I'm going to fast tomorrow for my lunch. And I'm going to fast tomorrow specifically at lunch for the purpose of prayer and Bible study. I've set those parameters. Okay. We can evaluate our giving. It's easy to determine how much my 10% is that God has blessed me with and how much I'm going to write my check for this coming Sunday and put it in the plan. So all of that is calculable. That's hard work to say. I can document it. It's easy. But you can't check mark your prayer. You can't count up your prayers. You can't log it in the register of a checkbook. Prayer life is more subjective. Why? Because prayer is ongoing. If I only prayed one time a week, and I'm giving my check one time a week, how effective is my prayer life? <laughs> Not real good. And that's what we really have to, have to understand. If I only pray one time a day, if I only read my Bible just a little bit during that one prayer time, how spiritually fit am I? Considering I have to generally eat three meals a day and a couple of snacks throughout the day to sustain my body. Now does the picture get a little clearer? And that's what prayer really is. Prayer demands discipline. We have to have discipline in our prayer life. And that's hard work even before Satan gets involved in this matter. It's easy to miss a morning quick morning uh, prayer quite time. Do, do either of y'all have a, a set time in your regiment, your routines of where you try to get your prayer time in in the mornings? Okay. Yes. Yes. Four o'clock. Okay. No, I understand that. I do understand that. Okay. All right. I've never been that morning person. Now I pray in the mornings. Don't get me wrong. But that's not my that, that's not my scoped in 33rd. Okay. On my prayer. That's at another time. But what happens in the mornings when you have your prayer time, so 4 o'clock or whenever? What happens when something screws around and you miss that prayer time? How, how does your day go? The whole, the whole day is gone. It's like, you, it's like you're burning pancakes, right? I mean, nothing, nothing feels right. You just can't do it. And then you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, I'm going to catch it later. I'm going to pray after a while. I'm going to do it right after lunch. I'm going to do it. And it never happens, does it? And then all of a sudden you are putting your, your, your sleep pajamas on and you're trying to, to wrap this thing up. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, duh, Jim, you have not prayed all night. Why? Because the distractions have kept you from it. It is a discipline. It is a discipline. The enemy may not be directly attacking us right this moment, but does that give us the reason to slack off being vigilant? In being alert. No. Here's a great example. Did any of us have somebody break into our house last night? No. So because nobody broke into your house last night, does that mean that you're going to go home tonight and you are going to leave your doors unlocked? No. You're doing it even though nothing happened. And that's what prayer really is. We've got to be focused. We've got to be ever watchful. We've got to be vigilant. Why? Scripture says because our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we've got to be ever watchful. Psalm 46, 10, powerful verses that we all know. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now as we wrap up the book, verse 21. Verse 21, I will just read the rest of the book. 21 through 24. Paul has now shifted gears out of the whole armor of God, and he's basically, he is signing off on the, on the letter. But that you also may know my affairs and how I'm doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, 
that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. The envoy. This is who's going. It's Tychicus. He describes him as a faithful helper in, in God's work. And he does it to encourage and to inform the church at Ephesus exactly what's going on with Paul and how Paul's doing. And then the last two verses is the benediction uh, in the, the entire letter. So let's, uh, let's, let's kind of wrap this up. Let's, let's look at the conclusion here. Does Paul give us the picture of a warrior as that of a long-range sniper? Does he give us the image of a warrior as the person on a battleship or a submarine firing missiles at the enemy? No. How about the pilot of a drone that's armed? No. No. Nor, nor does Paul give us the vision of a member of a ground troop that fires his weapon across the block or even across the room. Paul is the warrior that we're supposed to be as someone who is ready to for hand-to-hand -hand combat, and that's who he's teaching us and the words that he has given us. The only weapons described as this makaira, this small, deadly sword that we are to keep on our person. Now, I think it's amazing now that we as believers have the technology to always have a Bible on us on our phones at all times. Do you ever catch yourself throughout the day looking up stuff on your phone for your Bible? I think it's hilarious to do that. I love to search, and I love to do that on, on my phone. If you don't have it, you need to make sure that you get you version on your phone. It's an amazing tool for study, and just, just to help you. It'll send you regular reminders to read. It's just, it's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. The only weapon that we need is this small weapon, and it is our Bibles. It is the Word of God. It is to be used. When Satan is all up in your personal space. And that's how he works. He wants to get up in our personal space. And when he does, that's when we've got to be ready to fight. And we are only ready to fight when we practice. What would happen if our troops went into battle and they had not gone through mock training? They would fail royally. So we arm ourselves. We prepare ourselves by being able to use our weapon by staying in God's word and understanding it and memorizing it. It's critical that we do this. The only way to defeat Satan is with the word of God. Three times Paul calls us as Christians to take a firm position in the spiritual battle against Satan and all of his minions. When confronting Satan's efforts to distrust God, forsake obedience, producing Doctrinal confusion and falsehood, and by the way, there's a lot of it out here today. Hindering service to God, bringing division, serving God in the flesh, living hypocritically, living according to the world or in any other way. This armor, the whole armor, is our only defense. And Paul's very critical of that. Thoughts, questions, comments on the book of Ephesians. Just reminded here, you know, when we talk about praying all the time, that too often I think we give up and assume God's not going to answer or He's not going to answer the way we expect. And then I was reminded of, of Daniel, you know, they prayed for a month. And, right. And the answer to his prayer was off doing spiritual battle that he had no knowledge of. That's exactly right. Prior to coming to see him. And do we, do we pray one time and be done with it? God doesn't answer it. Lord, I prayed to you today. You didn't answer it. That means it's no. And God's like, you big dummy. It's just not time. Prayer is so critical. It's so vital. It's so vital. Guys, if you're not being attacked, I can promise you Satan is around the corner watching. Uh, the attacks will come. The enemy is real. He is real. I can't say enough. He is real. And we have to be suited up. We've got to be prepared. And we've got to know how to use our weapon. You cannot have too much training with your weapon. You can't be in the Word too much. You can't pray too much. Just going to be honest with you. But Jim, I ain't got time. 
you don't have time not to. You just don't have time not to. Everything we do of that nature is a, to steal a line from one of Tom Hanks' movie is a perishable skill. He was talking about shooting. If you don't yep. shoot regularly, you'll lose. If you don't shoot a bow regularly, if you're not sword fighting regularly, you're going right. to lose out. You, you're you're going to... Um, but honing your skills is what you're doing when you're practicing. I mean, you're going to lose that edge. You're going to, you're going to lose the practicality. These marathon runners, they can't just show up at a marathon oh, and expect no. to run the next Oh, no, 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 no. No, these guys are out here running mile after mile after mile. <coughs> if they just showed up with my Lord, I'd get the first quarter of a block. And then they're, I'm, y'all, I, I'm going to do good to walk in my car, much less run a, run a marathon. So there's got to be training involved. One would assume you'd need to rest up for a race like that. But if they sit on their laurels, oh. they can't compete. Mm -hmm. Cannot compete at all. Okay, starting this week, we're going to pick up on our study of the 12 disciples. We had gotten into that just before COVID hit, and we're going to pick that up. We have already looked at Peter, Andrew, James, and John. We'll probably take a refresher on those guys, and then what we will do is we'll pick up on the other eight. And we'll do our best to look at one or two per Wednesday night. Glad Jesus did this on them for falling asleep when they're supposed to be watching and praying. Yeah. <laughs> what a great example of that. You know, these boys were just like, my belly's full. I just ate. You just washed my feet. I'm sleeping. I'm, I'm taking that. You're doing the work, Jesus. I'm taking that. Yeah, no. Jesus said, no. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Guys, any other words? Thank y'all for coming. Thank you all so much. Thank you for watching online. We have a great crowd. Thank you so much. Uh, Sunday morning, we're going to be right back here at 9.30 Sunday School. 10.15 is the digital lobby. 10.30, we'll be right back and diving deeper into God's Word. Tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, Miss Pat will be on for uh, uh, her continuation of spiritual warfare. So that's going to be good. kind of goes right along with where we have been. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow morning and Friday, Lord willing. And we're just going to keep hanging out in First Corinthians. All right, guys, we're going to close the prayer. John, will you pray for us as we leave? Our Lord, we thank you for being so patient with us. God, not disowning us when we don't measure up what we ought to be spiritually or physically either for that matter. You know, we just pray, we praise you for watching over us as we sleep every night. You protect us till we get up the next day. You always have. And, and God, when we go to sleep tonight, we'll go to sleep trusting you're going to do it again. Just thank you, Father, for, for all you do for us. God, we have the most powerful weapon in the universe, and we use it probably less than we do anything else. Yeah. And God, just help us to be more fervent in our prayers. Also, there James, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Yes. God, we just pray that you would convict us of the power and the necessity our prayers and we give you all the praise for it in this lost and dying generation we've allowed us to be a part of in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Hey guys, we'll see y'all later. Bye bye y'all. Brother Jim, I won't be here Sunday.